everybody, it's my great pleasure to welcome you at this first online meeting of the International Dermoscopy Society. I will start with giving the floor to Professor Iris Zalaudek, the president. Thank you very much, Lydia. Great welcome on behalf of the IDS to all the people who are uh, currently connected with us. The pandemic was driving us into the direction that we have to organize an online meeting. But as things are moving, there are always two sides of the medal. The bad one is definitely that we cannot see us face to face. The other good side of the medal is that uh, Lydia just told me we have more than 5,000 people connected. So um, this is a huge success for the IDS and this is underlining how much we love dermoscopy. Thank you so much, Lydia and Tassina. And good to see you all guys. You know, obviously I wish I would be in Warsaw. Uh, Lydia, I don't see the statuette. Where is the statuette? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, it's there. Okay. This is a, a society made of nice people. But let me tell you that it, it seems to work because I already had a few emotions generated by uh, sharing this, uh, this cream with all of you that I miss so much. Many of you will know we had to switch the company who was helping us with all the logistics and the technical stuff. And even though there was not much time, you agreed to take this task. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rudnicka. On behalf of the CEO of Term Medical Medical Publishing House, Janusz Michalak, I would like to welcome and thank all our estimate guests and speakers for joining us today. I'm so happy that we have so many participants for all over the world. I think that we have been starting a new trip, international trip. And I wish you a very fruitful conference with our top experts and rising stars in dermoscopy. Thank you for being uh, with us. The idea was to make a regional meeting from Germany, Latvia, Sweden and Poland. Because of the COVID pandemic, we had to switch to, to the online version. But I would like to thank my colleagues for, for their participation and for their input to this, to this meeting. I wish you a great, unforgettable experience with this first online meeting of the International Dermoscopy Society and please stay online. Uh, good evening or better good day. Uh, I'm Peter Sawyer. I'm speaking now from Brisbane, Australia. And you know all quite well there was a bit of discussion over the years and decades. How should we call it? Surface microscopy, beautiful term, epiluminescence microscopy, which basically no one could pronounce. Dermatoscopy, and then L. L. Cobbs, he came up and said, guys, why we don't call it dermoscopy? And there was a consensus. It was not a li linguistic meeting. There was a consensus, a clear consensus that uh, we should use dermoscopy. Having said this, we decided when we founded the society to call it the International Dermoscopy Society. Hi, hello. It's a real pleasure to share with you as the president of the International Dermoscopy Society some thoughts about the present and the future of dermoscopy. And now there are other evidence proven diagnostic tools like confocal laser microscopy, optical coherence tomography, of course histopathology and we can use them. Still, dermoscopy remains the method of the millennium. One or another app which can be used to bring a lesion to the, to the doctors. I have now on my cell phone a new version um, of an app that was developed by the University of Graz. And let me tell you, I'm quite surprised about the performance. There are so many things new that in 15 minutes I can only mention some of them. Of course, you will have the chance to analytically listen information about all this during this uh, two days of the Congress. Thank you. Wow, this Congress started with like fireworks. I'm, I mean, come on, come on. The past, the present, the future of dermoscopy in one session. I can never forget my dermatoscope. You know, sometimes I, I, I forget it. I need my dermatoscope in my hand because otherwise my brain is not activated. You know, 
What I'm trying to say is that even though dermal nevi sometimes develop melanoma, but on the other hand, the probability is one out of 200,000 of these nevi. The furrow test is a rapid and easy method to facilitate the correct identification of furrows and ridges on polar skin. Liquid ink should be applied directly onto the lesion and left on the skin for a few seconds. The furrows will retain the stain and become clearly visible for dermoscopic examination in the form of thin ink-stained lines. Yeah, well, it's really now a great pleasure to introduce Professor Rudnitska, a well-known and world-known expert also in trichoscopy, working a lot, much of the knowledge that we know now in diagnosing hair disorders is based on your research, on, on sharing of your knowledge. So it's really a great pleasure. And she organized together with Gratinia this, this wonderful meeting and the voice to you, Lydia. Thank you very much. Joining. Today, I would like to give you some insight into how trichoscopy or hair and scalp dermoscopy may be useful for suspecting some diseases which we usually do not associate with hair and scalp abnormalities. So it is important to remember that hair loss is very often uh, the first sign of systemic lupus erythematosus. Go ahead and high magnification and you see the glomerular vessels here arranged more, uh, very often in lines and this is the typical pattern of Bowen's disease. I'm pretty sure that when we diagnose these slow growing melanomas at the beginning, uh, they are melanomas. If they persist in the skin, they will be really dangerous for our patients. Our protocol now is taking 24 total body photography images and a mean of 20, 25 um, dermoscopic images per patient. Uh, I am from Sweden and my name is Kerry Nielsen. Research has shown that the original pattern analysis is superior, but it has its limitations. Good morning, good afternoon, or maybe good evening. It depends where you're located all around the world. As here we can see this is also pink or red lesion, but there is no doubt. There is a lacunas or red globules, and we are completely sure that this is a vascular lesion and uh, this is a benign lesion. Hello, Thanks. my name is Paula Pasquale, and I'm here to share with you this conference called Dermoscopy and Teledermatology, a winning combination. When you take a picture on, with a dermoscope, you need one that is far away where you include the scale, and in fact, most dermoscopes, quality dermoscopes include a scale, and then you need to have a close-up to see details. Models, the like true transformation rate of moles into cutaneous melanoma is at worst, approximately one out of 33,000 nevi may potentially progress towards melanoma. Tony, Teresa, so, Dainlein, and Claudio Conforti, these were uh, the young colleagues that really put their heart into these studies, uh, worked a lot um, on the evaluation of data. And Hello and welcome. My name is Harold Kittler, I'm from the Medical University of Vienna and this talk is going to be about dermatoscopy of melanoma. But so what is important to know is that there are many types of melanomas morphologically but also genetically, you know that. Presentation, I'm going to talk about neck melanoma and the clinical and dermoscopic features. And here are some examples which you can see these melanomas with the regular uh, dots uh, on the left side in the regression. And on the right side, the regression is more evident because we have the combination of white areas and blue together. At first glance, you might think that both cases are lentigo maligna. Here you see the brown color, you see the annular structures here. Um, and also here and here you see a little bit more slate gray areas here some dots and clots and if you see this you might think also on another differential diagnosis and this is pigmented basal cell carcinoma yeah. and congratulations to the organizers 
you did and you do a very good job. Congratulations. So what I will present you here is an overview about possible um, features of the melanoma, which looks not like a melanoma. So we have two nodular lesions, red and more and less symmetric, a little bit more asymmetric on the right hand side. And we would say these are ever rising vessels. So it's for the BCC. But here, this is a melanoma metastasis. Some of you would also say these are ever rising vessels. But for me, this type of vessels are not really ever rising. It's more chaotic. And stay passionate with dermoscopy and in this meeting and stay healthy. Nice, um, nice. How big, how large margins should we use for severe melanocytic dysplasia? I always say I treat a severe melanocytic dysplasia as a melanoma in situ. I'm from the Kittner Institute at Sheba Medical Center in Israel. And a subset of these Spitzfeld melanomas showed reed-like pattern, a starburst pattern with streaks or globules at the periphery, and a lot of times blue-white veil at the center. What says that come on? Skin cancer is extremely rare in children. Squamous cell carcinoma does not exist. Basal cell carcinoma almost does not exist, and melanoma is extremely rare. So this is the only basis on which we tolerate uh, atypia. But then, as you showed. Yes, melanoma is rare, but it's not, but it exists. If say. there are there are multiple melanomas in a family, should we uh, examine the children? Okay, so, so I think from that study that came out pretty nicely. Um, I think the ones that I have not, I have not seen a, a melanoma in a teenager in these, this context, but they exist. And I think these are most of the pediatric melanomas. So I, I usually recommend in patients with a strong familial melanoma a background to bring their children when they're in the adolescence age. So a perfectly symmetric starburst pattern, but these were two melanomas. So the classical uh, spitzoid appearance, pigmented or non-pigmented, it's not always a synonymous of spitz nevus of a benign variant, mm -hmm. but the network in the periphery and regression in the center, which was called uh, stardust, so the, the, the end of the starburst. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, it's also nice because stardust and starburst do so a joke with the name. I can say that the starburst was one of the most successful metaphors well, thank you very much, especially thank you Iris and uh, Amelios for being with us the whole day and I'm uh, convinced that you will be there tomorrow as well, the day after tomorrow. I would like to invite everybody to join us for the concert. Uh, this is, will be a Chopin concert tonight. You are welcome to choose your wine at home as you wish. Uh, mm -hmm. And the concert will be approximately uh, 40 minutes long, so uh, it will be nice if you can join us. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so it was great. And let me tell you, you already wrote history today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thanks, thank you. You know, the Congress will be nothing without the speakers. So thank you, everybody, for being there. And thank you for the audience. The Congress would not have taken place without the audience. Thank you very much and uh, for everybody. Let's enjoy the concert, the evening, and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>
and uh, it was described uh, as a side effect of uh, epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors. Uh, Hello, my dear friends. I'm Dr. Daniel Ash Sigal from Mexico City. I'm the treasurer of the International Society of Trichoscopy. And we're going to report two cases of patchy alopecia that developed after mesotherapy for the treatment of androgenetic alopecia. What we saw in trichoscopy, there was a patch of non cicatricial alopecia with multiple yellow dots, black dots, and broken hairs. You know, like, you see, like alopecia rata. Thank you very much. And we're, please buy our book. Thank you, everybody. And I love you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to produce Dr. Rodrigo Pimes, who is a Brazilian like me. Hi, so thank you for the invitation. And today I'm going to lecture on trichoscopy evaluation of low dose minoxidil in female androgenetic alopecia. So the diagnostic feature of AGA is hair shaft diameter diversity. So in AGA, you have more than 20% of thin hairs in the affected area. This is the best trichoscopic marker of hair miniaturization. Today, which is I believe that oral minoxidil is superior in clinical practice. Hello to everybody. I'm Dr. Sergio Baño from Madrid, Spain, and I want to thank Dr. Lydia Rudnica for the invitation to talk about trichoscopy in hair transplantation. You have to be aware uh, about hair transplantation in primary cicatricial alopecia. We can say that uh, PCA are not the best scenario to do hair transplant because the survival of the grafts is decreased in comparison with androgenetic alopecia. But that was uh, the amazing lecture uh, trichoscopy in hair transplantation of Dr. Sergio Vano Galvan from the Ramon in Icajal Hospital in Madrid. Here is Teresa Deinlein and I work at the dermatology department in Graz. See the it's typical different. appearance of a nevus sebaceous with these yellow globules and fine vessels. And here we have the structureless grayish black nodule and this was a trichoplastoma. Thank you for your attention and I'd like to invite you to our World Congress next year. Professor Colombina Vicenzi from the University of Bologna. So I'm going to show you how to use a dermoscopy to select uh, the optimal scalp biopsy site. Of course, uh, the area you choose will depend on the disease you suspect from a clinic clinical point of view. Here you can see the keratotic plaques. The keratotic plaques are masses filling the follicular openings. Thank you, Professor Vicenzi. And we have some questions now about and medical legal issues regarding teleconsultation. No, that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> Telemedicine. <laughs> you know, in, in the United States, there are no medical legal issues. President Trump uh, um, asked um, providers to use telemedicine and even authorize applications like WhatsApp. Would you prescribe a private oral minoxidil for a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding mother with AGA? Uh, hi. Uh, so no, I uh, will not prescribe oral minoxidil for breastfeeding or women uh, expecting. Um, in patients um, breastfeeding, uh, nowadays the American Society of Pediatrics allows you to use topical minoxidil, so it's an option. Um, if you really believe you want to use or, uh, topical minoxidil in these patients, but not or my noxidil, and I don't prescribe it. Thank you, everyone, for the excellent lecture, for sharing your knowledge. Uh, I'm really very happy that we have the best world speakers in trichoscopy in this in this session. So thanks a lot for joining, and thanks for accepting my uh, invitation. It's longer. Good afternoon, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Dimitris Ioannidis from Thessaloniki, Greece. I'm professor of dermatology in. Uh, and head of the first department. Uh, and I have the great pleasure to introduce Professor Giovanni Pelacani. Uh, Giovanni will give a talk on uh, red light on ecoscopy. How Giovanni. could we improve lesion detection in non-pigmented alteration 
this is the device that weird the chance to uh, use and to test. That's a, a new device uh, uh, produced by Germanite that is quite peculiar as a shape. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Sanoba Darwala and today I'm going to share a few tips and tricks to make onicoscopy a little easier. This like in this image, we can appreciate the ridges present over the nail plate. And in the same image, when we visualize it under polarized light, the surface irregularities have been blunted and we can appreciate the vascularity of the nail bed. So, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm grateful to be part of this wonderful conference. And thank you, Lydia, for inviting me once again a slide on the glass. What you get, that polarized light is reflected by a mirror. Hello. I'm Leonardo. I'm the head of the hair unit in Hospital Regional da Asa Norte here in Brasilia, the capital of the Brazil. I will lecture about our paper named Panoramic Trichoscopy. And what is panoramic dermoscopy? Using the panel mode in a smartphone, you slide the dermoscope along the lesion and the image is done without editing it. That's it, guys. Here are my contacts if you have any doubts. Thank you once again for the invitation and a special thanks for Sofia Salis Martins, Espanol Abraham, now my wife, and bye. So thank you very much and let's proceed uh, with the last talk of uh, Prakas uh, Akaria. And uh, uh, he's going to give a talk on uh, scalp marking tools, please. This is good evening from Nepal. I'm Dr. Prakash Acharya from the Department of Dermatology, the College of Medical Sciences from Nepal. And today I'm going to talk about scalp marking tool, also known as the SMART tool. So we can see in this animation that the scale starts from the tip of the nose, passes through the midpoint of the glabella, through the mid part of the scalp, all the way to the inion at the back of the scalp. To picture the patient on device, maybe some company could uh, develop device to, to picture uh, rolling the, the, the camera, like do, doing a panel. Welcome everyone to our last session of the day. I really hope you are enjoying this event so far as I am. And today we have the honor to discuss some trichoscopy and dermoscopy with uh, great colleagues from around the globe. My topic is about trichoscopy in connective tissue disease. And if you look at these pictures, you can compare the size of the blood vessel that's larger than the terminal here. Here, The left side picture shows the tick arborizing vessels located mainly on the intervollicular area. My name is Pavel Petkiewicz. I work in general and Oncological Surgery Clinic Number 1 at Greater Poland Cancer Center, Poznan, Poland. And have... Some lesions may resemble lupus vulgaris, a variant of cutaneous tuberculosis, but in TBC there are no distinct clots, but blurred orange yellowish structureless areas and the vessels look more like normal superficial vascular plexus. Hi. I am Emilia Cohen Saban from Buenos Aires, Argentina, and I would like to thank Dr. Arudnika for this kind invitation. Video capillaroscopy and dermoscopy, they, they don't show any differences between the both. Another role of capillaroscopy is the early detection of patients at high risk to develop digital ulcers. Thank you, Dr. Saban. It was great. And I think it's beautiful to see how we all have been extensively trained into diagnosing melanoma and BCC and NIVI. And now we were all able to expand our knowledge into even um, before the clinician can, we are able to diagnose and help the diagnose of lupus and sclerosis and sarcoidosis, as you have all brilliantly uh, shared with us. Thank you. It was a great lecture. And now keeping our journey, journey around the globe, I would like to go to Israel and invite Dr. Geller. I am Shamir Geller from Tel Aviv Swarovski Medical Center. And I'm going to talk today about the muscopy in lymphoproliferative disorders. So looking at all of these cases together, you can see that lymphoproliferative disorders presenting as papule or nodules 
regardless if aggressive lymphoma, indolent, or only a reactive process like pseudolymphoma, all are very similar to each other, showing salmon colored area, background, with vessels which are usually faint, not in focus. Therefore, unlike some publications in the literature, I personally do not believe that dermoscopic patterns can be used to classify or to point to the exact lymphoproliferative subtype. Yeah, please. I would like to call Dr. Ovsherenko and Dr. Kobzi from Ukraine to talk about eyebrow loss. And Dear colleagues, I am going to greet you on the first online meeting of the International Dermoscopy Society. I sincerely thank Professor Lydia Rubinska for the invitation to be part of such a high-profile event with a fantastic team of speakers. It is a great honor for me to represent Ukraine. You should keep in mind that trichotillomania can coexist with another cause of hair loss associated with presence of eye uh, yellow dots. More than one person at the World Trichoscopy Congresses in Sorrento, Cancun, Rio, Temple of Course in Kiev. And thank you very much for your attention. It was great. Thank you, everyone. And I think we should now open for some discussion. What is the right site to take the biopsy in lymphoma? I think it would be addressed to Dr. Geller. Yeah, so th thank you for the question. So this is a, a very important uh, issue and it depends on the type of the lymphoma that we are dealing or suspecting. When we're dealing with mycosis fungoides, so the idea is to take uh, several biopsies that will have enough tissue also for immunohistochemistry and for uh, monoclonality doing PCR for TCR. But when we talk about uh, nodular lymphomas like B cell lymphomas or tumor, tumor stage of MF, we try to get like punch biopsies, getting into the deeper dermis or uh, taking incisional biopsies. Now, what is the role of dermoscopy in choosing the specific site and the specific area within the lesion? This is something that can be very helpful. And this is a, an area that is open for uh, studies like in the future. Is it like areas that have the more dense orange color, which we think that orange and yellow color in these lesions is because of the lymphocytes. So if we take the areas where it's more like orangey, maybe it's more like dense infiltrate of uh, lymphocytes, or maybe we should take the areas that are more vascular, where we have more angiogenesis. So this is an open field for all of us to study and to understand better where to, how to use dermoscopy for choosing the right area for the uh, biopsies to be taken. Uh, we do have great experience already here with oral minoxidil for hair, but how do you, do you feel about that for eyebrows? Yes, I'm absolutely sure with you and uh, it's very good uh, possibilities for future therapy. Yes, yes. And I, I agree to this. Thank yes. You. Thank you, Camila. Gracias. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, my dear colleagues. It's my pleasure to announce the second day of the meeting open. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Lydia Rudnitska and all her team for organizing this excellent meeting during these horrible times of pandemic, for giving us the opportunity to learn from and communicate with truly exceptional speakers from the whole world. And now I would like to give a word to our first presenter, Masaru Tanaka from Tokyo, Japan, a professor of Tokyo Women's Medical University. Thank you, Lydia, for inviting me to the first online meeting of ideas. I'd like to talk on unusual presentations of acral lesions. If you go into the dermis in the acral skin, you can see parallel arrangement of the epidermal reed ridges. One is crystal profunda limitans and the other is crystal profunda intermedia, which is connected with the crane duct. I will present now let me introduce our next speaker, Horacio Cabo from Buenos Aires, Argentina, a head professor of dermatology of University of Buenos Aires. Hi everyone, my name is Horacio Cabo. The title of my, talk, my conference today is Dermoscopy Cases from which I learned most. You can see here trace of pigmentation. 
and vessels. What type of vessel? Daughters, linear irregular, some comma vessels, different morphology of vessels, and the distribution is random distributions, and the pattern is polymorphic pattern. When you see a red lesions with traces pigmentations and a lot of vessels, the morphology of the vessels, daughters and linear irregular, basically the distribution, random distribution and the pattern, polymorphic pattern, you have to roll out hypomelanotic melanoma. In 2021, the next year, in June, the World Congress of Thermoscopy in Argentina, you are welcome to come to Argentina the next year. So here is the first question. Thank you for your nice presentation. How long should we follow up the Navy? Depending on the, the risk of the patient, because Navy are benign lesions. The, the, the risk is not uh, one nipia. The risk is the patient. The patient with multiple nevers, with atypical nevers, with personal history of melanoma and other risks. The high risk patients need follow up. So now I would like to announce the next presenter. It is Dr. Asper Marku from North America, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, New York. Good day. It is my pleasure to present the dermoscopic features of basal cell carcinoma, both the old and some of the new structures that we have identified over the last few years. An ovoid nest is a very large basal cell tumor island in the dermis, and here is the blue-gray ovoid nest, and it represents a nodule in the dermis, so nodular basal cell carcinoma. Question. Um, Ash, um, in regards to uh, some types of basal cells, particularly when they're on the face, um, one of the concerns always is, is that when we have a basal cell which shows a milky white appearance, um, or even milky white appearance with a few milli-like cysts, the differential is always either a Desmoplastic trichoepithelioma versus a morpheiform basal cell. Pleasure to announce our next uh, presenter. It is Professor Scott Menzies from the University of Sydney, Austria. Today we will see what Dr. Menzies wanted to change or add to his algorithm through time with his presentation, The Menzies Method, What Would I Change in 2020? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak and what was a interesting topic for me. Um, the title is The Menzies Method, What I Would Change in 2020. Well, the first thing is to understand what this method does, and it was designed to diagnose pigmented melanoma from all other pigmented lesions, including uh, non-melanocytic lesions. So in summary, what would I do to model um, to improve this, this method? Well, I would look at the positive features, whether to, whether to add them. I Thank you very much once again. So now I want to present our next presenter. This is Dr. Harold Rabinovich from Florida, US. Well, as you know, pigmented squamous cell carcinoma in situ is not always such an easy diagnosis to make clinically. These are all pigmented squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And dermoscopically, what we see here are these brown oval structures, some in a linear arrangement, vessels as dots in lines, and vessels as dots. Histologically, full thickness squamous atypia and this basal keratinocyte hyperpigmentation. Uh, pigmented squamous cell carcinoma in situ, what I normally do is if it's a small lesion, I'll do a shave excision, curate and cauterize the base and call it a day. Uh, if it's a larger lesion, uh, what I'll normally do is, is I'll do a shave biopsy and at a later point in time do a surgical excision. It is uh, Professor Luke Thomas from Central Hospital University of Lyon. Well, many France. thanks for this invitation uh, to this uh, kind of strange meeting because of the COVID-19. Uh, and with this, I would like to uh, thank all the uh, speakers in this uh, session. Uh, I think it was a great session and thanks a lot again for accepting the invitation and thanks for chairing the session to Nino. Thank you very much. Good afternoon from Warsaw. I hope you are all doing fine and you are ready for the next part of the lectures. 
So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Danica Teodorovic from Serbia, University of Nice. Uh, that will give a talk on dermoscopy guided biopsy in facial and tigo maligna. Dear colleagues, my lecture will focus uh, on the most of guided biopsy in facial and tegumental because lentigo maligna, and we can uh, find here circles within a circles, another dermoscopic feature of lentigo maligna and asymmetric lentigo openings. I think now it's the time to move to our next speaker, and this will be Zoe Apala from Greece. And uh, Dr. Apala will be talking about dermoscopy-guided biopsy in Paget's disease. Dear colleagues, I'm Zoe Apala, and for the next 10 minutes, we will speak about dermoscopy in Paget's disease. Biopsy when you have in front of you an elderly patient with a unilateral nipple involvement that displays dermoscopically a combination of scattered dotted and short linear vessels, white scales, erosions, and pink structureless areas, in the scenario of non-pigmented budget disease, plus structureless brown areas and brown gray granules in the case of pigmented budget. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Dr. Apala, for this uh, very interesting lecture. I guess it's a challenge to differentiate uh, Paget's disease and, for example, eczema, like in the 79-year-old female patient you showed us. I guess there is one question from the audience. Let me check. Yes. Did you find any lichen sclerosus on, on that mammary lesions? What would be the feature of it? Well, in our uh, cohort, there were no cases of lichen sclerosus involving the nipple and areola. Uh, also, there were not any cases of scleroderma involving the nipple and areola. So, in my view, uh, I, uh, based on data from this study, I cannot make any comments about this. I suppose that uh, in concordance with the histopathology of lichen sclerosis, what we expect to see is what we expect to see also in other, uh, other areas of the body, meaning that we can observe white, white structureless areas uh, corresponding to fibrosis of the dermis. We can observe uh, the uh, vessels, the telangiectetic vessels that we may see also in uh, other areas in, uh, of uh, lichen sclerosus. And uh, sometimes we can also observe these gray, gray brown granules. This is a clue also of, uh, of lichen sclerosus. And this is uh, um, something that we were able to observe in uh, pudget disease, in pigmented pudget disease. Uh, these gray granules and pigmented parts of disease do not correspond to uh, melanophages, as we see in melanoma, mainly correspond to pigmented pudget cells uh, uh, invading the epidermis, and uh, this creates this uh, granular pattern in, ma in pigmented mammary parts of disease. Okay, thank you very much once again. And uh, I see no more questions from may the I, audience. May I have, yes. may I have yes. one question, yes, for Professor? Course. Thank you so much for this excellent lecture. And I have one question. Could you be so kind to conclude the issues in dermoscopic examination when the lesion is just within the nipple? Because for me, it's a big problem. Because when we have um, any areas within the areola of the nipple, it's a big challenge for myself. Could you be so kind to tell me how can I differentiate, for example, melanoma? Because I saw last week this case and okay. drop so, the line, please. Yes, sure. Well, uh, this is a very important question in my view because we have to keep in our mind that this, there is no only dermatoscopy, there is also the clinical uh, presentation of the mammary pudgeon disease. And we know that uh, from this study that all the pudgeon patients, almost all instead of one in this uh, study, had nipple involvement, meaning that uh, we have to have nipple involvement to consider 
padded, mammary padded disease. This is one clue. The second clue is when the, the nipple is involved, uh, when it, the lesion is pigmented, uh, we expect to see these granules and this will help us to will raise the suspicion of mammary pattern disease. In general, when we have pigmented lesions, we are more alert, let's say, and we proceed with, uh, with uh, a biopsy much, much more earlier compared to non-pigmented pattern disease. So Dr. Ahmed Sadek from Cairo. Uh, that we'll be talking about dermoscopy-guided biopsy in scalp tumors. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ahmed Sadiq from Egypt, and I'm going to talk today about dermoscopy-guided biopsy in scalp tumors. Scalp tumors can be of many origins. So they can be of keratinocytic origin, they can be of dendritic origin, mainly melanocytic, they can be lymphocytic, vascular, adnexal, neural, fibrous or fibrohistocytic, mastocytic, mesodermal, they can have cystic changes, and they can be secondaries as well. Hey, thank you very much for your kind introduction, for having me over here. Hopefully next year we'll be able to meet uh, directly. Uh, regarding the field cancerization, it's a very prevalent issue, and uh, I believe that uh, prevention is uh, very important in such cases. Keeping in the shade some protection is really very important. People with the family history or past history of different types of skin cancers can go for chemo prevention as well. And I find that topical application of uh, five FU third generation topical retinoids as well on daily basis or every other day can really help. Also photodynamic therapy can do it in a very good uh, pattern. But if patient has a past history of skin cancer on the scalp or is currently suffering from appearance of photo aged skin on the scalp, I'd like really to examine them thoroughly in order to detect the areas of in situ change in the skin rather than the frank ones which anyone can detect clinically. And Thank you for choosing to watch this session named Dermoscopy Guided Biopsy of Nail Tumors. My name is André Castro and I'm a dermatologist in Lisbon, Portugal. The most common currently utilized biopsy techniques for the diagnosis of cutaneous malignancies include complete excisional biopsy using a scalpel, excisional punch biopsy with the entirety of the lesion confined within the surface area of the punch instrument, a deep shave biopsy with the use of either a scalpel or razor blade. Thank you, Andre, for this great lecture as always regarding intraoperative dermoscopy. So, do you perform it routinely? And if so, does it affect um, the procedure? That's an excellent question, Marta. Um, uh, Intraoperative dermoscopy is, I think, um, um, a technique that does not enjoy as sufficient evidence as I would like it to have. I Hello everybody again. Uh, thanks for joining the session. This is a special session. It is uh, sponsored by uh, La Roche-Posay, who is the diamond sponsor of this Congress. And I would like to take the, this opportunity to also thank our sponsors. Uh, you know that uh, thanks to the sponsors, in particular to our diamond sponsor, La Roche-Posay, it is possible for every doctor in the world to participate in our Congress uh, free of charge. And uh, as of today, we have 6,000 registered uh, participants. So thanks everybody for, for joining. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce um, two speakers today. Uh, both are my dear friends and uh, uh, world authorities on photo, uh, photodermatology. Uh, and also experts who belong to the most influential dermatologists in the world. So uh, hello uh, to Henry and hello to Harvey. Uh, the first presentation will be by uh, Professor Henry Lim. Hello, my name is Henry Lim. I'm from the Department of Dermatology at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. The topic that I'm asked to cover is on sunscreens, myths and facts. We should emphasize to all patients that the adverse effects of sun exposures are very, very well established. I would like to thank um, Professor uh, Henry Lim for his uh, great presentation and for discussing uh, the issues related to myths uh, about sunscreens. Uh, this was extremely informative. 
We will have the opportunity to ask questions after both presentations in this session related to sunscreen. And it is my, now my great pleasure to introduce uh, the second speaker, Professor Harvey Louis. Hi, I'm Harvey Louis, Professor of Dermatology and Skin Science at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. I want to thank the organizers and the sponsors for inviting me to participate in today's session on photo protection. Detection. We can't be together right now because we're in the middle of a global pandemic that we're currently managing using basic public health tools, masks and social distancing. In dermatology, we also deal extensively with public health issues, including STIs, HPV, infectious exanthems, and skin cancer. Our public health approach to skin cancer is based on good science and detailed knowledge about the relationship between skin cancer and outdoor sunlight. By simply... I wish to welcome everybody to this session that uh, studies the correlates between dermoscopy and histopathology. So I decided to present from direct from the pathology room where I do my reporting to make it even more meaningful of a session. And uh, the first speaker we have is Professor um, Harald Kittler from Vienna, who actually needs no introduction. He's not only a fantastic dermoscopist, but he's a great dermatopathologist, gave a fantastic lecture last year in Lisbon at the International Society of Dermatopathology. So we very much look forward to hearing his lecture on dermoscopy histology correlations on melanocytic nevi. Thank you, Harold. Hello again. My name is Harold Kittler. I'm from the Medical University of Vienna. And this talk is about dermatoscopic structures and histopathologic correlates in melanocytic nevi. Lines, dots, clots, which are one structure, including globules and circles. And these basic elements may form um, patterns. And if there is no basic element, we call the pattern structures. Uh, Harald, how are you today, my friends? <laughs> yes, there is always one with one question. So, so. regression might occur also in melanoma in cytokine, well, not, not only might occur, but we know it's quite frequent, uh, at least from a dermatoscopic point of view. How, how can we explain that regression is so frequent in purely intraepidermal melanoma? So, uh, does this answer your question why an epidermal process can make dermal melanin? Because the melanin gets from the epidermis into the dermis by disruption of the basal ma basement membrane by inflammation. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, I should add. I should add also that exactly as Harold said, that melanin irritates. It's irritating. So when it leaks down the dermal epidermal junction, often we get some kind of irritation in the papillary dermis. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker. I practiced all afternoon to give a proper pronunciation of her name because it's Polish. So the next speaker is Dr. Magdalena. Mishak Gawonska. My name is Magdalena Mishak Gawonska. I am a dermatologist like many of you. My special interests include dermatopathology and clinical pathological correlation, especially in inflammatory lesions. This system is composed of superficial and deep plexuses, which are connected by vertically oriented uh, arterioles. Joseph, we are looking forward to listen to what you have to say. Thank you, thank you so much. So it's it's uh, my pleasure to be here with with you, and hopefully in in, in the future in person. That is always warmer. But um, I I think it's it's as Emilio said, it's very relevant, and most uh, dermatologists don't care much about this. I have to say, but this is not a good a good situation. You don't see anything because I want you to to close your eyes. You should know about the standards, how to take pictures. Of course, you should take pictures of... Bravo, Josep. Thank you. Thank so you. maybe we'll have questions. I, I remember that years ago, not so long, uh, a good friend of, my, of mine in, in, uh, in the IDS was saying, Josep, what are you dealing with? This is really boring. Standards, technical standards, so color. This is boring, but I have to say that this is not boring at all. 
And the first presentation is from uh, Dr. Smigiel, uh, Kaminska, Rinchiorek, uh, Kolak Damas, and Olechek, uh, are looking at benign vascular lesions within the genital area. Dear colleagues, my name is Katarzyna Szyngiel and I will be talking today about evaluation of vascular lesions within the genital area with dermoscopy. Um, good afternoon, uh, I'm Magdalena Szechowska and the topic of my today's presentation is dermoscopic rainbow pattern. Good morning, my name is Mark and I'm from Singapore and on behalf of my team, I'd like to thank the organizers for accepting our abstract and poster. I will present on papular epidermonibus with skyline basal layer in an infant. Hello everyone. My name is Carolina Englert and I would like to present two cases of spitzoid melanocytic lesion. Hello, my name is Pavel Bitkevich. I have the honor to represent Polish Dermatoscopy Group. I would like to present you a case from our archives. Hello, my name is Anastasia Malevich. I'm from Vilnius University Hospital Santos Klinikos, and today I will present you a case report melanoma during pregnancy. Good evening. My name is Agnieszka Derkowicz, and I represent the Department of Dermatology, Venerology, and Pediatric Dermatology, Medical University of Lublin. At the beginning, I would like to thank the organizing committee for this invitation. The topic of my presentation is dermoscopy of skin cancers in immune suppressed patients. Hello, my name is Joanna Golinska. I should like to express my sincere thanks to the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to share with you this interesting case report on dermoscopy of cutaneous metastasis of prostate cancer. Uh, but I know that also in metastasis from the breast, uh, the, the typical pattern is homogeneous central, just with the small vessels at the periphery. I Hello, my name is Vercia Todorovska. I am a representative of the Macedonian Dermatoscopy Group. I will speak about nevoid melanoma. It is an uncommon subtype of melanoma that can resemble an intradermal nevus. Thank you for that most timely reminder, Virchi. Um, in my career, such as it is, I've seen two nevoid melanomas, and both of them looked even blander than that one, a lot blander than that. And they both came out on the um, uh, never trust a new growing pink nodule rule. Hmm. I think there is a one bigger message in this case, which I found very interesting. Up to recently, we believed that uh, pathology is the final answer. And now when pathology does not fit to dermoscopy, uh, sometimes it happens we call back to the pathologist and discuss. So I think that uh, these two methods, dermoscopy and uh, pathology are complementary and it's, this is not uh, anymore uh, that one gives the final answer and the other one is uh, just intermediate. I think that the message should be, as Lydia said, he told it before precisely, that uh, the, the, the gold standard of diagnosis of skin tumors is the integration of pathology with clinical examination, dermatoscopic findings, plus epidemiological characteristics of the patient. This is the golden standard, not one of them only. Hello, everyone. My name is Carolina Englert, and I would like to present the case of melanoma of a known primary site in a patient with multiple dysplastic nevi. Dear colleagues, I'm Daniela ledic delver and it is my pleasure to present our case on behalf of a group of authors. In the cutaneous spectrum of CD30 positive disorders, lymphomatoid papulosis and anaplastic light cell lymphoma can be differentiated. My name is Agnieszka Szmurwo and I would like to present a case report about endosymplastic nevus. Dear colleagues, I would like to present a clinical case from Vilnius, Lithuania, where we differentiated between a typical nevus and psoriasis. Well, thanks again for another fascinating case. It's been a remarkably and uniformly high standard of cases we've had present. Obviously, the whole question of using um, the dermoscope to evaluate inflammatory and non-tumor lesions is a new and growing field. I know Emilia, you've obviously been very actively involved in that. Obviously, the, the, these two days we are discussing a lot about it. Today we use our dermatoscope for everything, not only 
for the classic uh, indications, uh, but also for practically for any kind of skin disorder, even for the ones that still we don't have much uh, knowledge, at least we have acquired the mentality that it makes sense. It makes sense in, in any kind of, of skin manifestation. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session. I'm Dr. Jie Liu from Department of Dermatology, Peking Union Medical College Hospital, Beijing, China. Thank you so much from, uh, for the invitation from Dr. Lydia Ratnika and Professor Graze Kamiska Winkelreich. It's my great honor to be the moderator of this session, and I'm also glad to have Professor Lima to be the co-moderator of this session. Hello, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you all here, and I'm sure it's going to be a very, very good session. We have amazing speakers. I'm Mariana Lima. I'm from Brazil. I work mainly with hair diseases um, and I'm passionate about dermoscopy. I think inflammoscopy is very interesting. And so we're very excited to have these amazing speakers today. Our first speaker, Professor Emilio Lalas. Uh, this book has Chinese version in China. So he is uh, well known all over the world. Dear friends, uh, welcome to this session which is devoted on the use of dermoscopy in uh, general dermatology. I think dermoscopy will narrow the differential diagnosis from three to two or even to one. Like so uh, we do have a question. Did your practice using a dermoscope is somehow changed the, during the pandemic? Did you change your practice? Yes, we had to, we had to adjust, let's say, to, to this environment. Uh, the good thing is that non-contact dermoscopy gives you at least the option to avoid the, 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 the immediate uh, contact. Yes, yeah. it's Dr. Erichetti. Dr. Erichetti is from Udine in Italy. Hello, thank you very much for your kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Hello, my friends. Hello to everyone. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about terminology and basic dermoscopy parameters to evaluate in general dermatology. Dermoscopy in general dermatology is a growing research field, as testified by the several papers in this field published over the last few years. Hi, hi. What a great presentation, Dr. Erichetti. Sure, we have to understand each other to exchange knowledge. Yeah, I, I just would like to underline one thing. The most important thing in uh, general dermatology is the knowledge of histology. Thank you for the questions and uh, answers. And now I'll kindly invite our next speaker, uh, Professor Kumar Jha uh, from India. Uh, he will present uh, mucoscopy in general dermatology. Uh, hi everyone. I think we, I have my recorded presentation maybe. Um, greetings from India. My name is Dr. Abhijit Kumarja and I... Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. Perfect. And since we are in the lichen family, uh, we spoke about lichen sclerosis, we spoke about lichen planus, what about lichen nitidus or lichen uh, striatus? We agree. Uh, the main differential diagnosis is between uh, lichen nitidus and follicular eczema. And in that case, dermoscopy may be very helpful because in lichen nitidus, we have this structureless series uh, with very well-defined uh, margins. And another clue is the, uh, the absence of physiological markings in the context of the lesion. This is, these are the, the, clue, uh, the clues of uh, lichen nitidus. Good evening, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the session in flammoscopy. Looking at the excellent lectures and very interesting topics, I'm sure that it will be a great journey through the inflammoscopy. Hello, this is Francesco Lacaruba from Italy, and I'm going to talk about inflammatory disorders in children. Histologically, the yellowish areas correspond to hemosiderin degradation from exacerbation of erythrocytes. 
then the children uh, often are moving when you perform the hermoscopy. Children are happy to uh, to receive a procedure that uh, do not cause pain, uh, as nice. you know. And so. in some cases, in, in in early phases of psoriasis, um, it is difficult to, to observe the typical the typical uh, red dots, especially for example in the in the face. Hello, I'm Joanna Golinska. Psoriasis with changing dermoscopy features. I believe that you have seen these vessels quite often in psoriatic plaques. Such appearance of irregular linear and other vessels may suggest overuse of topical glucocorticosteroids. Indeed, basing on our results, wider vascular structures are present on lower extremities and smaller on the face. I'm, I'm sorry, I, my background is very dark. I'm, I'm calling in from Africa and we have issues with electricity here, but I'm sure we can hear my voice pretty yeah. well. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Joanna. Very beautiful presentation and very interesting too. Um, I, I want to find, find out if you've had any experience with um, demoscopic features in darker skin phenotypes. Great question. And I'm looking forward to study maybe um, with you. Um, Hello to everyone. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about balanitis. On the left, we have uniform, regularly distributed dotted vessels. On the right, we have orange ductulus serous and fairly focused serpentine vessels. So the diagnosis was serratic balanitis on the left and zoom balanitis on the right. And so, uh, do you have um, the same experience in the females? So the, the, the patterns are the same in the females? Oh, Francesco. So the, the, mm, the patterns are very, very similar to each other, actually. Uh, the difference is the, the prevalence of the diseases, of course, because, uh, for example, soon uh, vulvitis is uh, quite rare. But... Good evening to everybody, and uh, special thanks to Professor Rudnika for this uh, kind invitation. I'm sorry. I cannot be with you and I can be, uh, attend this meeting that uh, uh, sounds very interesting. My talk today will be on the parasitic infections. And uh, as you know, dermoscopy, uh, I'm sure most of you will use dermoscopy for common parasitosis, including scabies and pediculosis. But dermoscopy can be useful also to enhance the diagnosis of tropical parasitosis, such as uh, gingiasis, myiasis, and larva migrants. Uh, but what in, is important is that dermoscopy ensure a more detailed in vivo evaluation of both mites and nits. It was really interesting uh, lecture, so uh, thank you, Professor Michali. Uh, Good evening. I welcome you at the last session of today. I welcome very warm, warmly our speakers. Uh, we will listen to five lectures in the session titled Onehoscopy, from Onehoscopy to Therapy um, is Bianca Maria Piratini that will be talking about isolated nail psoriasis from Onehoscopy to Therapy. Good morning to everybody. First of all, thank you, Professor Rudnika, for the invitation. I'm going to talk about neosoriasis from onycoscopy to therapy. Here you see this slightly dented margin, which we marked in order to show you it better, surrounded by a yellow-orange band. These uh, onycoscopy features can be utilized for differentiating onycolysis due to psoriasis from onycolysis due to onychomycosis or due to trauma. Thank you, Professor Piratini, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I think we have one question from the audience. Which are the dermoscopic differences between subungual hyperkeratosis in psoriasis and subungual verruca? Thank you. Good evening to everybody. So, subangual verruca is usually limited to a part of the nail, while uh, scales are diffused all over under the nail plate, and they are very easy to take away. So, these scales are soft and really easy to take away. If you have a subangual wart, the scales are uh, more um, adherent. Often, you have some 
small blood hemorrhages uh, of, a, of a wart. And if you detach the nail bed, you can easily appreciate a subangual wart as a, a normal uh, skin wart at dermoscopy, which is not just case. Questions? There is a question on the duration of the use of yes. steroids. Mm -hmm. I usually follow the patient every two months in order to see if there is an improvement and lack of side effects. So if there is an improvement, you gradually taper even the uh, uh, frequency of application of topical steroids. If you don't have any improvement, you have to move to something stronger. Like This is Matilda Yariza from Switzerland. And um, the title of the stock is Isolated Lichen Planus from Onychoscopy to Therapy. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Lydia, also for uh, having me. So I will talk about, as you said, isolated uh, lichen planus of the nail. So no other association, no oral, no skin, no scalp, uh, with particular attention to uh, onychoscopy and treatment. Recently, um, we have uh, wrote a, a consensus. As you can see, there are a lot of uh, nail experts among the authors. We shared our experience. Matrix involvement is very easily treated with intralesional steroids and also bad, probably, but it's very painful. So intramuscular triamcinolone is preferable. Hoping to see you uh, numerous at uh, the European Nail Society annual meeting. It will be an on-demand session during the EADV that, as you know, this year is uh, virtual. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to talk today about dermoscopy-guided biopsy in inflammatory diseases of the nail apparatus. Another manifestation of nail bed involvement in nail psoriasis are splinter hemorrhages, which are a result of a destruction of capillaries that, that run longitudinally along the nail bed. If you need to take the nail matrix biopsy, you may also just use your punch and just go through the lunula down to the bone. Uh, but sometimes you will have to retract the nail fold because lunula is not always so easily seen. Uh, Hi, good evening to everyone. And thank you again for inviting me in this wonderful Congress. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you all the organization. And I'm going to talk about the tracunicium from onychoscopy to therapy. Okay. Uh, onychoscopy, it is important to perform because uh, tracunicia is a superficial alteration, so an alteration of the nail plate. When you have a surface alteration, it is very important to use a dry dermoscopy, where we, with the onychoscopy, we observe this fine longitudinal striation covered by thin scales and mild thinning that uh, induce this opaque uh, appearance of the nail plate. You can use a premilus if you have a tracheonychia, maybe where we have a light lichen pla nail lichen planus uh, and you are sure the diagnosis. But if you're not sure about the diagnosis, maybe it's a lumbisha reata. Are there any long-term studies about children with tracheonychia? Have they got LP? alopecia or psoriasis in the future? So we have a lot of patients and um, some of these patients started maybe only with the tracheonychia and in the future when they have an adult age, they start to, to have an associated disease as alopecia reata or maybe psoriasis. It is possible that tracheonychia can be the first sign and then when there is, uh, uh, by the age, it is possible to have other signs. But 30 years is a very long follow-up, I think. I'm always a little bit skeptical, but you are the experts, with topical treatment for nail diseases. And you mentioned that tracheonychia systemic treatment will give uh, positive results after approximately three to four months. What is your own experience with topical treatment and when would you expect uh, improvement? With topical treatment, yeah. so if you not have in this case a severe cases of tracheonychia, you, maybe the result can be in one year. Mahima Agraval from New Delhi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Mahima Agraval from India, and I'll be speaking on onychoscopy in longitudinal melanonychia. 
Another very important use of dermoscopy is to catch the micro Hutchinson sign, which is pigmentation uh, observed only dermoscopically. And that's an early uh, form of Hutchinson sign. What is the limit of the age when, when, when you may consider melanocytic subangual nevus in, in a patient with longitudinal melanonechia? Uh, most commonly, we encounter the congenital melanocytic nevi in children, but adult onset nevi are also not uncommon. We often come across such patients, uh, especially in our type of ethnicity. In At conclusion, uh, if I may say, we consider uh, all onset uh, uh, before the age of five or six uh, um, a melanonychia of a single digit uh, um, when uh, uh, explaining it uh, like a lentigo or a libus of the nail matrix. If you have an onset afterward, so it would be puberty or adulthood, we consider it like uh, an onset in adulthood. So I would say before the age of 10 to make a cutoff. Matilde, do you agree? Even earlier, seven, maybe seven. Yeah. Then the cutoff is adult versus children. And so all the way to deal with the pigmentation is different. I would like to say big thank you, and I hope you enjoyed and could learn something new. Thank you very much. Have a good night. I would like to introduce my colleague, Professor Rutkowski, is the current head of department of soft tissue bone sarcoma and melanoma, and also vice president of Scientific Council of Maria Skłodowska Curie National Research Institute of Oncology. Good morning. It's my great privilege to present the lecture about the current approach for oncological advanced melanoma. My to summarize my talk, Advances in systemic adjuvant therapy in high-risk patients are the most important therapeutic achievement of recent years. Adjuvant therapy is standard of care, and next step should be uh, neadjuvant therapy in uh, clinically detected disease, plus minus adjuvant therapy. Good morning, everybody. I would like to start the very nice, I think, the next uh, session dedicated to colors and shapes in dermoscopy, dermoscopic updates in malignant tumors. Uh, we have a wonderful, uh, fantastic speakers and uh, the first lecture, it will be red tumors. What can the vessels tell us of Professor Jorgen Kreusch? Ladies and gentlemen, this is a introduction into the world of red tumors of the skin, which cannot be diagnosed reliably by clinical means. As you see in the next slide, red nodules do not comply with regular uh, criteria for tumor diagnosis. You need additional uh, instruments, and this is demoscopy in, the, in most of the cases. Please note and see that the right image displays loop-like vessels in a disorderly uh, arrangement all over the lesion, no traces of melanin, no traces of whitish halos around the vessels. Whereas on the left image, you see that the uh, reddish lesion does not display uh, distinct vascular structures. In these cases, I would decide immediately for excision of the right one. As I can. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Kreutsch. I'm, I'm so happy to see many many friends again uh, in this awful moment. Uh, yeah, this is Ralph Brown from Zurich in Switzerland. I feel very, very privileged to be part of that course. And, uh, you know, I was asked to contribute and to talk about white structures, so shiny white structures, dermoscopy based on shiny white structures. Let's dive into the topic, but please let's just start with some conflicts of interest first. Uh, there are some conflicts of interest. I'm an editor of a book of the Atlas of Demoscopy, now soon available in the third edition. The Handbook of Demoscopy and the Atlas of Demoscopy, a French book. And I'm coordinator of Demoscopedia. Demoscopedia is the Wikipedia for Demoscopy. So we try to create a free online resource in collaboration with the IDS that should provide you with precise up-to-date information. 
And again, like Wikipedia, we need you as an author, and it's only, you know, the community that could make it great. It's not one author that could write Wikipedia. It wouldn't work. So same here. So we need you and your contributions, your pictures to make this a great resource. But check it out. It's www.demoscopy.org. Okay. First of all, I hope that uh, we will not lose, lose uh, Ralph uh, and uh, we can discuss with him about this very beautiful topic. <laughs> Uh, a question for me. Uh, I, I'm uh, convinced that uh, Rosette sign is only an artifact. Is uh, uh, it is not a structure? Uh, it, it is not a structure, but it's only the, the light that is uh, reflected from the follicle. Do you agree with this? I think it's it's absolutely agree with you. All of them, all of the shiny white structures are criteria that are artifacts, that are optical artifacts, they're only seen in polarized light. They're so good morning, my name is Jonathan Bowling, I'm a dermatologist based in Oxford in England, and I'm here to talk about melanoma simulators in dermoscopy, particularly regarding the colour black. And in this case we can see again a focus of black pigmentation, but at the margin we can see these areas of uh, red uh, pigmentation and these red globules which are tracking along the dermatoglyphs in keeping with blood uh, from this um, subcorneal hematoma. No. Okay, now it's working. Um, and we start about mucosal tumor lesions. When is the excision demanded? And um, I always like to start with this um, picture. It was a very good suggestion from Professor Alfred Kopp from New York, USA. He said, when you use your dermoscope at the mucosa, just apply a transparent food wrap and just wrap it around your dermoscope and then you can use it without any contact um, of the mucosa. And um, it is helpful, but I will show you, you don't need it because you can um, use it without any contact and then it's visible. We will, I will show it you later on. So hopefully so we one. see you all in person in next year in Argentina. So thank you very much for your attention. Stay passionate for the, in the field of dermoscopy for the patients, for yourself and stay healthy. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi. My name is Philip Chandel. I'm from the Medical University of Vienna. And today I'm going to talk to you about a basic shape in dermatoscopy, clods. On dermatoscopy, we see again one pattern, clods, um, one to two colors. It's blue or brown, uh, some white structures. So you immediately think about what, right? BCC. So this is why we biopsied it. But it's not a BCC. It's a SEPK of a clonal subtype. And, and if you want to train more of the differential diagnosis of combined nevus versus melanoma, I suggest you go onto our free teaching platform, Derma Challenge, where we have a dedicated level where you see a lot of combined nevi and melanomas with blue structures where you can become more proficient in actually differing these two diagnoses. Uh, you showed us two algorithms where uh, if you have a, one particular color of clods, the situation is a little less ominous unless you have blue, which will amount to BCC. But uh, can we generalize and say uh, as to, you know, which colors are very ominous, if you could just tell us, uh, you know, which colors you find very, very ominous and you would want to uh, biopsy immediately? Uh, I think a combination of colors is actually what is the problematic pattern. Um, as, as long as you have one color, it's, it's, it's usually something benign, especially for red, um, for red and brown. But as soon as something becomes asymmetric or multiple colors, these are the situations where you have to be really wary and have to be really confident that it's a benign diagnosis that you can specifically name, otherwise it would biopsy these things. Um, of course, there are a lot of other things I didn't show in the lecture, for example, like uh, like this, if you have a rim of globules, that's usually a benign pattern, but if the patient is not 10 years old, but 60 years old, um, you have to be more worrisome. And it has nothing to do with the pattern in itself, but with the situation where you find it. So it's not only morphology that you have to evaluate uh, for these cases. Okay, thank you very much. So there were a few questions which Dr. Bloom had answered on the Q&A panel. I'll just be sharing that with the audience because I'm uh, given to understand they can't see the panel. 
So the first question was, do you have to do an exam of the genitalia in every single patient? Uh, Dr. Bloom, could you answer that live if you don't mind? Or do you want me to read out the answer? Anyway, uh, please. Uh, no, I, I just I just can answer that there were three questions. Um, how we do, uh, how we should use the dermoscope now in this present time with this COVID um, um, infections um, possibility. So I do the disinfection of the dermoscope after each uh, examination and I exchange a dermoscope also. So I have three dermoscopes available. That means I disinfect, I take the next one which has been disinfected before, I disinfect it once more and then I use it and then I take after the second examination the third one and then also the disinfection after and before. So we'll move on now to our next speaker for uh, the morning session. Uh, we have Dr. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Rudnitska and Dr. kaminska Vinciorek for their very kind invitation. So far, uh, there is well-established uh, knowledge on the dermatoscopic evolution of a superficial spread in melanoma. However, uh, there is scarce evidence in literature for the dermatoscopic um, presentation and evolution of a nodular melanoma. Nodular melanoma is the most aggressive type of melanoma. I was honored to take part in this uh, international multicentric uh, study. I worked with this great group of uh, colleagues and uh, skin cancer experts from uh, 13 countries uh, all over the world. And uh, I would like to express my special thanks to our professor Alexander Stratigos, who was the leader of this project. And of course, my acknowledgements to my great friend, Emilio Lalas, for his utmost help. Practice. So whenever we have uh, an arising, uh, early arising and large nodule with uh, dotted vessels, light brown coloration, sometimes also imitating um, benign lesions, beware sometimes because it can be a thin nodular melanoma. Hello, I'm Rosario Peralta from Argentina. First of all, I would like to thank for inviting me to this session. Uh, now I'm going to talk about clues for recognizing collision tumors. The International Dermoscopy Society uh, launched this multicenter study with the aim to characterize the dermoscopic features of collision lesions to determine the most common lesions and to analyze possible reasons for them. Thank you very much for your attention and hope to see you next year in Buenos Aires. Hello, good morning to you all. My name is Pedro Zavallos, an Spanish enthusiast of dermoscopy, and I'm very glad to be here. And first, I'd like to thank Professor Rudnika and Professor uh, Kaminska and the rest of the organizing committee for inviting me to this first online meeting of IDS. I'm going to talk about malignant collision tumors. I mean the association of two or more different neoplasts within the same lesion being at least one of them malignant. What are the criteria for taking a biopsy when you have a collision skin lesion with a melanocytic component and a vascular component? Okay, is it um, maybe this is a huge question because, but uh, I think that maybe uh, if you are suspecting that uh, there, there is a bad component in the lesion, it's better to excise all the lesion to, to analyze. Hello everyone. It's a great honor for me to be a part of such a huge and interesting scientific meeting. Professor Vinska, Professor Kaminska, Vinchorek, thank you so much for the invitation. Dermoscopic examination of an eyelid margin with standard hand dermoscope, in my opinion, is extremely difficult. Small contact plate is needed for precise and automatic examination. All of our pictures have been made with PhotoFinder video dermoscope with small contact plates after delicate aversion of the eyelid as a immersion fluid we use saline solution. I would like to introduce our dermatosurgical team from Gdańsk. Thank you for your attention. So I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first is, if you excise uh, one, any of these lesions, how do you preserve the eyelid and the margin and how do you protect the eye? You know, uh, we can, um, that procedure is not very difficult. We can fix, you know, uh, eyelid with special stitches 
and uh, we can do it without any contact with the eye. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ofer Ryder, and in the next 10 minutes, I will be talking to you about the dermoscopic features of basal cell carcinoma and its subtypes. I have no conflict of interest, and most of the images in this presentation were taken from Dermoscopedia, which is um, an excellent resource, and I invite you all to use it. This is a graphic illustration I created um, to show the frequency of each structure. So if the circle is larger and closer to the center, that means that the feature is more frequent. Over the years, for something so like a superficial BCC, do you think we can get away with only dermoscopy and not doing an actual histology? Yeah, I think that's that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, I think it's a little tricky because dermoscopy does have a very good sensitivity and specificity for basal cell carcinoma, but um, there are mimickers and the, there are the times that um, we can be wrong. I think that maybe adding an additional tool like confocal uh, microscopy or OCT that um, can improve our diagnostic accuracy is maybe the better way to go at it. And then you can make a diagnosis with um, a higher accuracy level without taking a biopsy and then either follow up or doing uh, the treatment that you choose for destruction with laser and so on. Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel Salerni from Rosario, Argentina. And I would like to present you a series of small diameter melanomas and the role of dermoscopy and digital dermoscopy follow-up. Group number one, the melanoma was the reason for consultation. Group number two, melanoma was detected during routine control of nevi. And group number three, the melanoma was detected due to changes of third during digital dermoscopy follow-up. Good morning. First, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and giving me the possibility to present the interim data of our study. Melanoma sun damaged skin may clinically and dermoscopically implicate diagnostic difficulties in patients with solar lentiginosis due to enhanced regression of those uh, types of melanomas. So okay. I, I thank all the speakers for enlightening us uh, in this enriching two-hour long session on updates on uh, skin malignancies and skin tumors. I thank everyone. I thank Professor uh, Rudnika. I thank Professor Gazina for this wonderful opportunity and this excellent initiative of our first mm -hmm. uh, virtual conference of the International Dermoscopy okay. Society. So thank hello you. everybody from Kiev. It's my great pleasure to join you in the, um, this wonderful uh, meeting. So the final session uh, is named Tips and Tricks in Dermoscopy. From my point of view, it's the most interesting, interesting topics for all practicing dermatoscopists. So uh, I will just uh, share with you the, the very the well-known seven rules that I revised uh, a little bit. Probably you are familiar with them. Uh, it's years that we, that we discuss about these seven rules and uh, I did a few uh, modifications that I would like to share with you, which is the number one reason even today that we miss melanomas, then the answer is not that we are not able to recognize melanoma. We are very good in recognizing small melanomas, early melanomas. Okay? The reason number one is that we don't give ourselves the chance to see the melanoma because we don't address our patients. So that's the rule number one. Thank you very much and greetings everybody. It's great to see your faces in these strange times. Um, I'm going to talk about a decision algorithm for non-pigmented skin lesions, prediction without pigment. This is not an algorithm to make a specific diagnosis. It's an algorithm to make a decision as to whether to excise or, or leave a lesion. Now just look at this image on the first slide and tell yourself what you think this is going to be histologically and we'll find out towards the end. I do have some conflicts of interest. Um, this is the main one. I, I'm uh, an author of, of this book along with Oksana Marazava, and it's a great book. Dermatoscopy and Skin Cancer, a handbook for hunters of skin cancer and melanoma. And of course, we examine the whole patient every time. I hope the, the images came through clearly. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rosenthal, for the beautiful presentation and for sharing the very, for diagnosing, diagnosing of non-pigment lesions, especially for the non-benign vessel morphology. Uh, so are there any questions from the uh, panelists? No, I just wanted to say hello to Cliff. I guess you see hundreds of non-melanoma skin cancer a day and the experience is really amazing. 
So thank you, Iris, and great to see you too. Yeah. <laughs> there is a question, I think. Bogdan, if you want to read, there is a question for Cliff. Uh, okay, so I now. So the question is a dermatofibroma cliff would be excised according to the prediction without pigment algorithm? No, because before you apply any algorithm, you try to see if you can unequivocally recognize the lesion as one of the five common benign groups. The dermatofibroma is one of those five. Uh, what I've seen is that technical that technological advancements and other kind of advancements or so-called repurposing of dermoscopy for various different purposes has become more of a fad and less of a fact. Dermoscopic microscopy, we are talking about high magnification dermoscopy. An affordable lead dermoscope for patients for home use has been launched. I could not get a photograph of that despite my repeated attempts. And lumioscope, which is just a hand lens which provides two to five X uh, magnification can be used as- Good afternoon. I'm Trilok Raj Tejasvi. I'm from University of Michigan. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about teledermoscopy for the practicing dermatologist. 2020 has not been kind to any of us. This pandemic has made our life upside down. A learned man once said, necessity is the mother of all inventions. Thank you all the speakers uh, for the beautiful presentations and uh, I think that we uh, maybe have some uh, little time for, uh, for a discussion before uh, Professor Rudniska will uh, start the ceremony. So uh, anyone wants to um, have some uh, questions or maybe some points for discussion? Well, I think that uh, indeed teledermatology uh, has become a quite hot topic in times of the pandemic and, uh, and I think dermatology as a morphologic speciality is fitting quite well and uh, actually we are, we are also implementing teledermatologic services now in our public hospitals. So, um, uh, that's becoming more and more important. No, okay, so I want to thank all the speakers and we can close the final session and I want to thank those three days and I want to give uh, the microphone to Professor Rudniskov. Thank you very much. Good morning to all. Um, nice that you are joining us for this uh, a beautiful uh, morning, exciting What's New session. So I would like to welcome everybody and uh, please don't hesitate to write uh, in the chat where you are joining us from. It's always nice to see where people are coming from. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. At the beginning, I would like to thank organizers, Professor Rudinska and Professor Kaminska Pinczorek for invitation. When the weakened part of hair shaft reaches skin surface, is and is exposed to trauma, hair breaks off. Those in trioscopy, black dots are observed. In the end, I would like to encourage you to use every available opportunity to learn trioscopy. Thank you. Good morning. First, I would like to congratulate Dr. Lydia for this wonderful meeting. I will talk about aplasia cutis congenital. I am from Brazil, from the University of Brazil. And what we see is the hair bulbs with a very dark proximal ends. Uh, they are visible through the epidermis and they are the same that we can see using microscopy and uh, histology. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. Today, my speech is about the pressure alopecia. This is the iceberg theory in the conical pressure distribution. You can see in the picture, the middle of the lesion is more affected and could be suffered a great ischemic, ischemic area. And in the peripheral is not involved. Thank you. Uh, and I think it's, it's fascinating uh, to see maybe if, we, if COVID would also have any impact on that for people who are staying for a long term. And uh, we will proceed with uh, the next talk. 
uh, which is uh, from Dr. Siluk Tatiana from Russia, that she will be presenting on occipital fibrosing alopecia. Hello, dear colleagues and friends. The uh, topic of my presentation is occipital frontal fibrosing alopecia. Uh, it is her trichoscopy. Uh, you can see absence of follicular or stem, loss of vellus hair, belly peral scaling, and pili torti. Dear colleagues, this is my city. Uh, this is St. Petersburg, very beautiful city, and uh, I would like to invite you uh, in 2022 June to the uh, annual European Hair Research Society meeting. Wow, another wonderful talk and um, also a wonderful perspective, so I'm noting it down in my calendar. I already launched a question about uh, the possibility of having maybe uh, pressure alopecia due to uh, uh, long hospitalization in COVID. Um, perhaps uh, Dr. Martinez can comment on that. When they finish with the treatment after three or uh, two or three months, they say, well, look at this, uh, uh, the occipital uh, in the head, the alopecia uh, or, or the scarring uh, probably is the, uh, are developing in, the, in, the, in, in this part. COVID is uh, today, but many of patients and in this, uh, uh, intensive care units, uh, it's uh, very important to move the head. And thanks you, Mirta, for uh, accepting the invitation to chair this session. Thank you. So it's a very uh, international uh, session because uh, one of the speakers were from Brazil, the other from Mexico, then we have Poland, we have St. Petersburg, so a lot of, um, of different uh, people. We are ahead of schedule for the moment. Wow, so, yeah. that's much better than yesterday. So hello again uh, and uh, thank you for joining us in this What's New uh, morning session on uh, trichoscopy. Very exciting session so far. So I'm happy to present now the next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Donati, who will be talking on frontal fibrosing alopecia. Hi everyone, my name is Alini Donati. I'm a dermatologist from Brazil and it's an honor for me to participate in this international dermoscopy meeting. I'm a passionate of frontal fibrosing alopecia and the question she made me was uh, from trichoscopy to therapy, what's new? Well, we all know trichoscopy is essential for frontal fibrosing alopecia. This has been published in 2013, seven years already, by Dr. Wakaruba, and he showed that the main dermoscopic finding of uh, frontal fibrosis is the absence of vellus hairs over the frontal hairline. So it was a really exciting uh, talk. Uh... Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Donati. And uh, we'll change a bit the system because we have speakers from very far away and um, they are joining us and it's the middle of the night or very early morning. So we will take questions now for Dr. Donati if anybody has something to ask. Well, before we have the questions from the chat, uh, I have a question. Alina, congratulations, uh, great talk as always. What user is your technique for marking the place on the scalp? Actually, I use the natural uh, reference points that the patient already have. And if he, she doesn't have any point, she will always have the scar from the biopsy. So I think at least one point we will have to follow. Good morning to everybody. My name is Daniel Fernandes Mello, and my speech will be from trichoscopy to therapy, what's new regarding dissecting cellulitis. Here, we can see the difference between hair tuft, polytrichia, and skin clefts. Hair tuft, we can mostly see in the calvans, and skin clefts, we can usually see in this uh, disease called dissecting cellulitis. And I will never forget the 3D thing with the bubble soap. I think this is so evocative of, uh, of the image. Uh, we have to thank Professor Hudinika and the Polish group because they uh, started with all this 3D bubble uh, yellow dot. If I can interrupt you for a moment. Actually, the story of the 3D bubble is a little bit different because I was sitting at a dinner with uh, my French friends, with Pascal Regain and, and many others. Somebody said they look like a soap bubble. 
And this is, I took it from the dinner and I have brought it into the Atlas. And this is the, how the story started. So I'm not the first one to have the idea. It just, I was the first one to write it down, but thank you for mentioning this. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Our lecture on from trichoscopy to therapy. What's new in discoid lupus erythematosus patients? What is interesting here is actually that they resemble those vessels that we see, the tortuous vessels that we see in BCCs, in basal cell carcinomas. And that's why if BCC comes into your mind, you should always think of uh, lupus in these patients, especially in small and single lesions. So it is my pleasure now to announce the next speaker, which is um, Dr. Tulin Gulec from Turkey, that she will talk about polyculitis decalvans. Please. Dear colleagues, hi to all. I am Dr. Tulin Gulec from Ankara, Turkey. Today I will be talking about polyculitis decalvans, a rare kind of primary scaring alopecia. On trichoscopy, we can also see tufted hairs sometimes in dissecting cellulitis, uh, but the number of hairs are usually fever and they're coming from skin clefts. Dr. Docter, that she will give a talk on syphilitic alopecia. Good morning, everyone. First, I would like to thank for the invitation to be part of this first online meeting of the International Dermoscopy Society. And today I'm gonna to speak on syphilitic alopecia from trichoscopy to therapy. Dermoscopy findings are very inspecific. We published a paper some years ago in, in which we described the three cases and also uh, the trichoscopic findings. Uh, basically, we can find a decrease in hair density, few yellow dots, some broken hairs, and sometimes a zigzag hair, which is a partially broken hair. So here are my atlas of hair and scalp dermoscopy. I will leave here my email in case you want to contact me. And thank you very much for the invitation. And also thank you very much for your attention today. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Sanuba Daruwala. And uh, today we are going to discuss a long traction alopecia. And, um, my presentation today will be about the value of trichoscopy in diagnosing tinea capitis. The Morse code appears as white transverse band along the hair shaft due to localized areas of fungal infection. It occurs with the microsporum ectosrix pattern of hair invasion where the uh, hyphae and spores colonize the surf outer surface of the hair shaft and signs sometimes tend to invade under the cuticle. And thank you so much for your attendance and for listening. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. I will be talking about dermoscopy of scalp lymphoma. And I have found the first trichoscopic description of mycosis fungoides in Atlas of Trichoscopy by Professor Rudnitska and colleagues. And the authors describe the presence of decreased number of follicular units, uh, milky red globules, orange yellow patchy areas, uh, vessels of serpentine like uh, dotted or globular shapes. And I would like to thank Professor uh, Magorzata sokołowska voidowo from our department, who is an international expert in the field, and we cooperate in dermoscopic studies concerning skin lymphomas. So the next presentation would be by my friend uh, Michela Starace from Italy. Hello, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mirko, it's for my the presentation. To and to share good morning to everybody. And, and I have chosen to be here with all the knowledge, knowledge and friends and experts. Knowledge, 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 knowledge,
we can classify it in the three important uh, clinical features and the early phases where we have but especially a keratotic and erosive plaque with this yellow the and brown crust and, and no follicular sterile pastel and in this, uh, and in men, this uh, reversible mm, group we can also add uh, well, a new variant is the hypergranulated variant. One of the answers that I have chosen for you some information which I think is interesting in the area of what is new in trichoscopy and therapy of androgenetic alopecia. There is recently a lot of discussion about new treatment options in androgenetic alopecia, but I thought I ask you and myself the question, is androgenetic alopecia, both in women and in men, reversible? Well, here's the answer. One of the answers you find in uh, Instagram from Sir Giovanni, and I love his uh, cases. And here's a case of hair regrowth, which I think is incredible. But is this possible in every patient with androgenetic alopecia? The other thing which is typical for androgenetic alopecia is the fact that the follicular units very often consist of two hairs, one of them is thick and the, one, the other one is significantly thinner. I will shortly summarize my opinions which I included in this presentation. First, I believe that follicular units with only one hair which is thick and one thin first are a marker of androgenic alopecia, especially the early form, and second, they may indicate the higher probability of hair regrowth. Second, my treatment of choice in androgenic alopecia is oral minoxidil with finasteride or dutasteride, and I also mentioned that the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, finasteride and dutasteride, may be of some benefit in patients with COVID-19. I would like to thank you very much for watching. And if you would like to see more about hair diseases and especially about trichoscopy, please consider joining my YouTube channel. Thanks a lot. We are at the end of the session and uh, I would like to thank all the speakers from all the places. Here you are, Michela. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm here now. And, and, and so thank you all uh, from all parts of the world for, with, for being with us with the short cases and uh, regarding the dermatoscopy and trichoscopy. Here at this virtual dermoscopy conference, my name is Anastasia Schleyer Stefańska and I have a, a privilege of working with Professor Grażyna kaminska winczorek in Gliwice. And today I will share with you some insights from our ongoing prospective project Good day, everyone. Greetings from Nigeria. I thank the International Demoscopy Society and Professor Rudniska for this opportunity to share experience on central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia in a Black African man trichoscopy histologic correlation. Any diagnosis of CCCA in males may be delayed, but trichoscopy helps us to rule out other important differentials like androgenetic alopecia and folliculitis keloidalis nuke, which is very common among black males. There are no differences in the trichoscopy and histopathologic features of CCCA in males and females. Thank you for your attention. In Brazil, we have many uh, dark-skinned patients, so we do see a lot of patients with CCCA, and I do agree it's really hard to differentiate this disease from LPP uh, on trichoscopy and also on histopathology. And we published a paper re recently that we found that around 25% of the those patients, they had acne, keloidalis, nuke associated. So maybe this can be a clue in this uh, patients. This is interesting. I see that Bruna joined us. Do you have a comment, Bruna? No, I just like to, to say that it's a beautiful case. And for me, it's almost impossible to differentiate FAPD in African-American patients from CCCA. So I think it, it seems like it's all the, the same uh, inflammatory process and miniaturization. So it's just to keep in mind. The most characteristic feature of highly, highly disease are white clots separated by the pink furrows, visible in 100% of our patients. We also observed in the most of patients crumbled fabric pattern and 
with white dots surrounded by the blood vessels. Thank you very much for the attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a pleasure to present two cases of drug-induced folliculitis in our two cases, this kind of destructive folliculitis, we think fulfill the criteria of folliculitis, the calvus. Why? Because the location was typically on the vertex. Patients reported itchiness and pain. Acute inflammatory neutrophilic cicatricial alopecia was clearly visible on trichoscopy examination. And what's more, the implementation of systemic anti-inflammatory antibiotics and potent topical corticosteroids gave a good response. Yes, I'm sorry that I'm again the one to start, but uh, uh, I think uh, that the talk of uh, Dr. Chuvara has one other aspect which we have to consider that with the rapidly rising number of oncological drugs, we are seeing rapidly rising new types of skin lesions and I think this is a field which needs to be learned because this is something what we did not see before. Dear colleagues, annular lichen planus is the rarest clinical variant of lichen planus. Dermoscopically, pigmented pattern was seen with diffuse fine peppering. Good morning, I'm honored to present a clinical case of ochronosis. Dermoscopic pictures of ochronosis showing grayish and brownish structureless areas and single thin vessels. I think it was a very nice presentation of this ochronosis. I just want to say uh, that we should keep in mind that we should differentiate this from melasma, which is a very frequent, uh, common uh, disease in our daily practice, and also uh, to differentiate this from lichen planus pigmentosus, which can be associated with frontal fibrosis and alopecia, especially in dark-skinned patients. This uh, facial pigmentation uh, could be a sign also of uh, frontal fibrosis and alopecia. So we should examine the eyebrow area, the frontal area, and uh, to look for maybe facial papules that sometimes are associated in those patients. It's just uh, one comment. And uh, I would like either to, to add uh, some hyperpigmentation from medication, from different medication. Some ACA inhibitors, sometimes they give some hyperpigmentation that we have to differentiate in elder age, of course, people that could take this medication. And uh, I would like either to add that poikiloderma of Sivat sometimes can be presented to the neck and uh, to the face with this manifestation. Early diagnosis, it gives the possibility to the family and to the patient, the possibility to be treated and to be under the correct control, in fact. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I would like to present trichoscopy of follicular mutinosis coexisting with alopecia areata. In histological examination, mucin deposit on the outer root sheet of the hair follicles, in addition to inflammatory infiltrates composed of lymphocyte, macrophages, and eosinophils around hair follicles were presented. In conclusion, follicular mutinosis may coexist with alopecia areata. Trihoscopic features of follicular mutinosis include white polyfollicular scaling, spermatozoa-like vessels, and white lines. Dear colleagues, this segmental diarrhea disease is a rare genetic disease. Only around 40 cases have been described in English literature. On dermoscopic examination, multiple polygonal or roundish brownish areas surrounded with yellowish structureless areas were seen. Thank you for your attention. Like each one of you in dermoscopy, I also try to look beyond the surface. Good morning, my name is Anna Stockmal and today I would like to present characteristic trichoscopy findings in a patient with systemic sclerosis and focus on a diagnostic value of trichoscopy in this disease. Another characteristic structures with maybe which may be observed in a trichoscopy of more than 20% of patients with systemic sclerosis are teleangiectasia and con that consists of enlarged, deformed, and budded capillaries. 
Giant vessels perceived as specific for systemic sclerosis represent extremely enlarged and broadened solitary vessels. I would like to only emphasize that it works to uh, see and look for these uh, vascular patterns in patient in every patient with telogen effluvium. Yeah, yes, this is yes. a very nice comment because it can be a cause of telogen effluvium. I, I would say that, and also I think the trichoscopic features uh, are very in the specific in this case, and I do think the examination of the nail, uh, the proximal nail fold, can really help us. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Maja Kotowska. Over the next two minutes, I'd like to provide an answer to a question whether can we suspect systemic lupus erythematosus on the basis of hair loss and trichoscopy. It's quite valuable to use dermatoscopy, to use trichoscopy, either for the diagnosis and either to follow up uh, the patient. We have many women who come to the dermatologist complaining of uh, hair loss and then when you ask them they will say well i also have some arthralgia but uh, this is because i work hard and yes i have uh, uh, sun hypersensitivity and they are not aware of a disease like the lupus so i think it is important to, uh, that dermatology requires really a lot of internal medicine knowledge to be a good dermatologist yeah, and I, I want to comment that in the systemic lupus, the trichoscopic features are very subtle. And sometimes just the, we can just find the typical vessels. Congratulations for this presentation. Very nice. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Anna Czaplicka, and today with this case, I would like to present the brief story about challenging diagnosis of morpha on Kudusab. We need to remember about the importance of the follow-up because sometimes one disease can be mimicking other and the clinical image may change over time. And the second one, alopecia has systemic aspects and the end of the dermatological diagnosis should be at the same time the start of looking for another disease. Dear Chairman, dear attendees, today I would like to present the case of the dermoscopy of the morphic skin lesions in a patient with acute myeloid leukemia. To conclude, the cutaneous lesions in the course of acute myeloid leukemia, especially in the setting of leukopenia, may not exhibit the infiltration by malignant cells. Uh, however, the dermoscopy of these lesions may resemble that of leukemia cutis, showing primarily polymorphous blood vessels. Uh, I think that uh, during the everyday practice, during the every single patient, we have to take our dermatoscopy with us. If I could just comment, uh, we had in this conference uh, four different lectures which were associated with lymphoproliferative disorders and dermoscopy. And I think that this is a new evolving field because lymphoma, various types of lymphoma are very difficult to identify on the basis of uh, clinical evaluation. The diagnosis is usually by histo histology and we wait for the results. So if we could have a preliminary diagnosis with a dermoscope, I think this will be a big advancement in dermatology. Hello everyone, it's very big honor for me to be here and I am very proud to be invited to such a great event. Thank you so much to our organizers, thank you so much to Professor Lydia Rudnitska. I'm going to talk about uh, three cases from my practice, three cases of folliculitis decalvans uh, that were misdiagnosed early as uh, seborrheic dermatitis and I'm going to talk about and the diagnostic value of trichoscopy in our practice. We could see the stuff with uh, six, seven, eight, and nine hair in one tuft, uh, very interesting pictures. And this is uh, folliculitis decadence again. So dear colleagues, I wish you luck with uh, you uh, trichoscopy practice and welcome to my cities and Petersburg to the annual meeting of European Higher Research Society which will be held in June 2022. Thank you for your attention. Congratulations, it was really a nice talk and this is a message to take home that uh, every time that we see a patient 
Do not just sit uh, in the room with light. Use your dermatoscopy. And with this, we are finishing uh, this uh, this session. And thanks a lot to all speakers and to all the persons who have prepared these uh, great cases, to the chairman, to the experts, to the audience. Uh, I would like to thank you for joining. Please stay online. In a few minutes, we will have the closing ceremony. And to the experts, please switch with us to room number two to the online uh, to the online um, uh, version of the of the meeting. Well, uh, it was a great pleasure. We had a lot of trichoscopy, onochoscopy, and inflammoscopy in this uh, block of sessions, and I think that this shows that this is now a stable part of dermatology, and I very, I'm very happy with this. And I see you in a moment. Well, hello again and hello at the closing point of uh, our meeting. Uh, and um, there are many people I will thank today because without multiple persons, this would not, this meeting would not be possible. But I will start with the president of the International Dermoscopy Society, Iriza Laudek and the Secretary General, uh, Amilios Lalas. If not the two of you, and you believe that we can do it, uh, and you gave us the task to do the meeting. So thank you very much. And I uh, give the room to Iris Alaudis, the president of the International Dermoscopy Society. So Lydia, uh, first of all, thanks to the team, to all the speakers for putting all these efforts to make uh, this what I would call really a historical meeting in the history of the IDS possible. Um, Lydia showed me and uh, gave me a last update <coughs> about the number of participants. And there were on average 6,000 participants watching uh, uh, the lectures. So in my view, this is a huge uh, sign that uh, the IDS is connected with uh, the members, with the fans of Dermoscopy, and uh, I'm just impressed uh, about the, the, the success and the high quality of lectures. And I want to thank you as the president of the IDS for the speakers, the participants and Lydia Grazinha for, for having done an enormous effort. So thank you very much. And uh, I give uh, the, the word to Emilio. Now you covered me fully. Uh, nothing more than a big thank you to Lydia and Gratska. It's been great. It's been much better than what could uh, we could ever, ever imagine. Uh, at the beginning. All the credits go to you. Uh, I hope that the, part the participants enjoyed. We tried to uh, to involve interaction as much as possible, given the limitations of the online event, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the result and Lydia and Gratska, that's all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh the meeting would not have happened without the help of Professor Grazina kaminska vinchorek who was really a huge support in everyday organization of the meeting. Uh, would you uh, like to say a few words to the participants? Thank you so much. It was a really inspiring days for me and thank you for all participants and all our top experts, outstanding speakers and all uh, at least and Tindians uh, also in, in the uh, expertizing panels and discussion panels. I wish you all my best and hopefully see you soon, probably in Argentina. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Grazina. And uh, I would like to thank all of you uh, who are watching us today and who are watching us throughout the Congress. We had all together 6,110 registered participants. So it's a huge meeting. I'm not sure. Maybe it's one of the hugest online meetings. So uh, I believe that this is uh, historic, not only from the perspective of, of our society, but also in, in dermatology in general. I would like to thank uh, the speakers. Uh, we had really top world experts and they all agreed to participate in this uh, meeting and share their knowledge. Without the speakers, we would not have such a meeting, which many people say that you, uh, your perception is that it was a good meeting. And also the chairman who did a great job by chairing the sessions and trying to keep the time and uh, on the other side to let the people uh, continue the discussion when there was an interesting topic. The meeting would not be possible and the free registration would not be possible if not the sponsors. And I would like to thank the diamond partner of the meeting, La Roche-Posay, and also the partners Dermlite and Novartis. And also the supporters of this meeting were Abvin, Heine and Leo Pharma. So thank you very much for your support and for your continued support for dermoscopy and dermatology. Also, I have to say a big thank you to the whole team of Termedia, the technical office. The work was even more difficult than usual because it was the whole technical aspects which we do not have to take care of in an everyday meetings before COVID. And uh, I was already telling some of the co-organizers, uh, Termedia needed to buy new servers every day because we had so many registered okay. participants. So really uh, you did a great job and thank you very much to the whole team. Uh, with a final word uh, to the audience, uh, thanks for being with us through the meeting. And uh, I'm sure that some of you may have become new enthusiasts of dermoscopy. And uh, I'm sure this is a diagnostic technique, which is a breakthrough of the 20th century. So you are experiencing what is becoming new in dermatology. And thank you a lot. thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you very much. See you next time. God bless. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>